So for the, uh, the last presentation of the, uh, of the Enterprise track, um, Sam Hartman uh, is going to be talking about uh, Moonshot, the Federated Authentication System. Uh, Sam has uh, been a Debian developer for quite some time, uh, maintains the Kerberos packages um, and uh, several other packages in, in Debian, has also has a lot of experience with uh, authentication systems, uh, working, uh, among other things, with the Kerberos uh, group at, uh, at uh, MIT. Thanks, Russ. So I wanted to finish today on, we talked a lot about what the current state of Debian is and what people are doing. Um, but I think it's always important to look towards the future as well. Um, and um, so I'm working on a project that um, is, I think, a new enterprise authentication technology. And it, it, when, you know, we have a bunch of people standing up here talking about Windows and how important Windows is, and that's always true. But we need to remember that it's important for us to keep track, to keep control of our own destiny. If we are not innovating, if we are simply playing catch up with Microsoft, or anyone else, then we are not moving the industry forward. Maybe we're making things cheaper, maybe we're making things more free. Um, but if we don't use that freedom to actually advance, then we haven't really accomplished a lot. So I like to, so it's important for us to understand how Debian can be a tool to bring new things into the enterprise, things that aren't there today. Um, and since I happen to be involved in a project that I think has that potential, I'd like to talk a little bit about that and Debian's role in that project and how Debian can be this, a tool um, for smaller changes as well as the sort of big changes we heard about this morning. Um, so the problem we're trying to solve, there are a lot of great technologies out there, or at least a lot of technologies out there for dealing with authentication for web applications. We've got OAuth, OpenID, SAML. Well, that's great, except enterprises are faced with plenty of thick client applications that just aren't the web. So is this use cases? Or is this, what no, is oh, what is Federated? Okay, so um, in this talk, we're gonna be talking a lot about federated authentication. And, and for us to do that, um, I'd like to go into a little bit of detail about what I mean by federation. There are a couple of different definitions of federation. This is the one I'm gonna use. Um, I think it's a perfectly fine definition. There are other definitions though that you might run into in other contexts. Um, federated authentication is when you have an organization or a, an organization that, that offers identities. This can be as simple as me running a server in my home that is my um, identity server, um, or it can be as complicated as um, you know, someone like Stanford University um, or even some huge corporation having, you know, thousands or millions of identities. And they have someone else out there on the internet who wants to use these identities to provide a service. It might be, you know, my bank wants to provide me a service and is willing to trust me to assert that I'm who I say I am. Uh, that'll take a while, but, you know, we could hope. Um, or it might be something like um, I'm an enterprise and I've contracted with someone um, to provide a service to my users. So let's look at what some of those use cases might be like. This is use cases, right? Okay, so um, the first use cases, we have you know, exactly the sort of um, outsourcing that, that we were, uh, Evan was warning us against this morning. But in the enterprise, you know, frankly, we, we all understand that this is often a reality. Um, and sometimes someone can do something better as a service than we can, and so we'd like to be able to, for our users to use it. So imagine a university wants to outsource its email, um, and they want, you know, but they want to maintain control of some of their data, and in particular, the critical data that identifies their users. They don't want to give the outsourcing provider a copy of their, you know, password file. Instead, they would like the uh, the outsourcing provider to come to them and say, "Well, you know, this person wants to log in, and here's who he claims to be. Are they legit? Yes, no." And if so, you know, what's their name and what's the other information we need in order to, um, to use them? The second use case is things like uh, grid computing. Um, the, um, one of the, the project leader on this effort, uh, Janet UK, um, has identified a number of organizations in the UK that um, are in the high-performance computing space that want to offer um, high-performance computing as a service, um, you know, um, and also that want high-performance computing for business continuity. Um, the final use case is something that's really important to remember is ever-present in the enterprise. That's 
I've got some random application. You've never heard of it before, but it's really important to me. And it's some application within my enterprise or some application between my enterprise and a couple of small business partners. It's not important what this application is, but it's really important that it work. I'm sure anyone who's spent any time in the enterprise can name you know, many of these. And it's really important that your technology work well with that. So this is components? Actors. Oh, actors, okay. So there are, a couple, there are several of different um, people who are going to be um, part of this. Uh, I'm gonna I want to go through and describe a little bit what we're trying to accomplish and, and the technologies we're using. Um, then I can sort of go and discuss what software is in involved and how Debian fits into the picture. So one of the actors is the identity provider. And in the enterprise context, we generally think of this as an organization, um, you know, basically the enterprise. Um, note that in the public web context, there are plenty of people who want to even sell you this. Um, you know, Facebook would love to be your identity provider. Amazon, with Amazon pay phrase, would like to do that too. Um, so would Google, so would, you know, lots of people. Um, but in the enterprise, this is typically one of the things you're actually going to want to own yourself. And so, you know, Stanford's probably going to be Stanford's identity provider, et cetera. Um, another um, organization is the service provider, someone who's providing service to your users. And then there's the glue in the middle, the federation. Um, some, something or someone who's providing trust between people who don't always know each other. Now, in some cases, this can be peer-to-peer. -peer. Basically, I can directly have signed a contract with you that says we're going to trust each other and you know, you're going to accept my identities. And so the Federation may, may be kind of a no-op. Um, but there are a lot of cases, you know, things like in common, edugain, that sort of thing, in the education sector, a lot of federations among uh, business sectors where the Federation is, very mu is a very critical part of this. Basically, it's a legal entity that is designed to reduce the number of contracts you have to sign as well as a technical entity that is, resigned, or that is designed to um, reduce the number of you know, complicated agreements you have to, uh, complicated um, protocol conversions you have to do and to actually get a level of interoperability. Um, and I think that's it for this. So, what? Yeah. Okay, so going on to um, what all we're gonna have to do, uh, build in order to make this work. This is the components, right? So. Um, we're going to need to specify some way that you talk to your identity provider and, um, and that you authenticate with them. This is different than the web federation systems. The web federation systems pop up a web browser and basically argue that the, the exchange between you and your identity provider is out of scope for federation. There's a problem with that. It's called phishing. Actually, there are a couple of problems with that. One of them is called phishing, and another one is called um, the where are you from, from problem. Um, you can get into some dreadful situations where the system is prompting you to say, which of these 900 organizations is sponsoring you? Pick from the list. Um, and that's really not a great user experience. Phishing may be a great user experience, but it's still undesirable. Um, Yes, and, and so um, we, we would like to avoid it. And basically, um, it's, uh, in designing Moonshot, we've decided that the, the way to avoid it is to actually think about the interaction between you and your identity provider. Pretty clearly, we need to have an interaction between um, the service provider and the identity provider. That's you know, the actual federation. Um, so, that, so that the service provider, effectively there's a disconnect. Basically, the protocol you speak to the identity provider can be completely separate from the protocol that you speak to the Federation. That way you can use whatever smart cards and that sort of thing you, you want. Um, the second, um, but then we're also going to want to think about how the identity provider describes you to the Federation. Basically, um, how it makes statements like what your name is, what your entitlements are, you know, what access you should have, um, you know, what organization you're a part of, that sort of thing. Um, okay, so then we're gonna go into a little bit of detail about each of these. This is the um, authentication slide? Okay. Um, we've chosen to use the extensible authentication protocol for you talking to your identity provider. Um, you've, you may have used the extensible authentication protocol. It's what 802.1x uses. Basically, it's very popular for logging into wireless networks. Um, 
One of the, the, the reasons for this is, you know, we have a lot, there's a lot of experience with that with EduRoam um, and with a bunch of um, wireless things that are, you know, beyond, that are um, enterprise beyond the education sector. Um, and the, one of the great things about EAP is that it supports pretty much any credential with the, from my standpoint, ironic exception of Kerberos. Um, that you, you might possibly want to use, um, you know, whether it's username and password, certificates, weird biometric stuff, one-time passwords, whatever, EAP can do it. For federation, we're choosing the biggest federation um, protocol in the world. You know, there are a lot of people who go talk about how many web identities they have, how many, you know, um, open IDs there are. There are a lot more cell phones. Um, and frankly, the cell phone and wireless um, um, industry has a lot of experience with, AAA, with something called uh, AAA protocols, radius, diameter, that sort of thing. Um, and the education sector, where, where Moonshot is you know, originally coming from, has a lot of experience with radius. And so basically, radius is the most successful federation protocol that we have today. And so we've chosen to use it. This is app integration? Yes. Um, We've chosen, so we need a way to get into the applications we care about. Your email reader, your web browser. It's a little bit ironic that we're talking about um, needing to get into your web browser for um, authentication for non-web, but it, it turns out that there are some cases where you need that. Um, your instant messaging client. Um, your, um, you know, whatever, take your pick. Um, the Kerberos community has done a lot of trailblazing for us here um, with GSS API, both at the protocol level Everything from SSH to IMAP to XMPP to um, DNS even supports GSS API. Um, on, and there's pretty good support, especially in Debian, for this in Kerberos. The support for things other than Kerberos is not as good. But it's there, and we're going to make it better. How am I doing on time? Are you reporting the best? Great. We're doing great. So since we're doing great, we're going to frighten you with a picture. Uh, this is network access. Um, and basically what we have is, is multiple entities. On the left, um, I, and I, I, I hope this diagram came out when I cut and pasted it from an, another deck. I, my um, slide view is not up to actually producing this on my own. Although I guess I could have used Graphviz. Um, but the, um, on the left, we have the client which is divided into, um, basically, there's an EAP supplicant, um, and then there's uh, an EAP lower layer, something like 802.11. Um, and on the right, there's, um, an av there's, there's the network access, you know, your access point, um, and your authentication goes off to the, um, to the AAA server. And so basically what this means, you know, it's just, that's on the further right, right? Even... Uh, Right, okay, so, and then on the far right is the AAA server. Um, and so basically what happens here is that you have a tunneled conversation. You basically are talking to the authenticator, or the, the network access point. Um, and the network's access point is taking all your traffic, um, and in that traffic is this EAP packet, which the network access um, point really can't, once the conversation really gets going, understand. It's encrypted. So it's tunneling, and it's allowing you to have a private conversation with your identity provider, the AAA server on, over on the right. And at the end, it and you both learn a key, as well as some authorization attributes about you. Um, and so basically, this, the, you see all the components we were talking about. You have a protocol between you and the IDP, the EAP. You have a protocol between the um, IDP and the service provider, AAA. Um, you have security against phishing. You, have, you know, all the things we want, except this is network access, and we might kind of want to do a little bit more than network access. So we changed the labels. Um, we haven't really changed the protocol flow much. I mean, basically, this is more or less exactly the same thing, um, except rather than, um, than using um, a network, we have an application like an email reader in the middle, or in the, you know, between the left and the middle there. Uh, we still get a key. We still get you know, uh, the ability to do um, protection against phishing, all the sorts of nice things you'd want to do. Um, 
this is the point where terms like channel binding and EAP channel binding and GSS channel binding and protection against man in the middle all come up. And I'm happy to go discuss any of those details. But um, basically, there, there are some subtleties here. Um, but the, the, the high level thing is that we've managed to turn network access into application access. Um, there's some work to do. Uh, but basically, what I'm trying to show with these two slides is that conceptually, it's the same thing. Okay, what is this? This is so. This, that's an overview of our technology. Now I want to talk about the project. Um, we believe in open standards. We believe that the easiest way for people to um, to be able to understand and analyze things from a security standpoint is to go right down what it is. And so we're going to do that. But we also believe that for technology to be successful, you have to actually have code. Um, and we need open source code because that, that will, well, first of all, because that will drive adoption and innovation and, and you know, there, I don't really need to sell why open source code is good to this community. Um, but we're going to do that. Um, and we're also going to try and actually put it together in a test bed and deploy it and see if it works. And we'd love for people here to be part of that. So, roll it no. Okay, so basically, um, right now there's a website, www.projectmoonshot.org. Um, there's actually a project plan using uh, what, is, what, as far as I can tell, is the best project management software in Debian, Task Juggler. It's scary if you've never used it before. You write up your project plan as a program and compile it into uh, project reports. Um, it's absolutely great for me. I was shocked when the, the, the client was, was excited about using it. Um, but it's actually been a, a really wonderful tool. Uh, we have a bunch of open mailing lists, um, and we have a bunch of documents that are going to turn into specifications. Um, we have implementation coming from across a number of different organizations. Some of them are being funded by Janet UK. Some of them are being funded out of the Jean 3 project. Um, you know, some of them are coming from other places. Uh, really pretty, you know, exciting group of people. Uh, and of course, pretty soon now, we're going to have some repositories and code. But we also need to get this integrated into an operating system for it to be useful, which brings us to the role of Debian. Um, Debian, that's this, I'm on, okay, okay. So the, the goal here for Debian, and it, it, basically, you have this problem if you're trying to really sell a technology in the broader world that, sure, you've got this proof of concept, and if I get enough tin cans together and whistle in the right way, you know, maybe I can hear the voice from the next room. And maybe I can imagine how in 100 years um, that might actually turn into a world-spanning communications revolution. Um, but the, the, the guy I'm trying to convince that this is great may not have my imagination. So it's a lot better if I can actually just build the, um, the world-spanning communications revolution. Of course, that requires actually getting it into the hands of everyone. Um, well, it doesn't just work that way if you go up to some commercial company and say, hi, I think I've got a good idea. Don't you want to go put it into your product? You know, they say, well, where's our customer demand? Wow. Your customers won't demand it until they understand how good it is and until the people they want to talk to have it. But with Debian, you can go up to the project and you can say, hi, I want to help. I want this, new, this cool new idea I have to be available. People say, well, you know, is it actually going to, is it going to break things? Is it going to get in the way? But these are technical discussions, and your proposal can be based on the, the merits of its technical, um, of, of its actual technology, and on how much effort you're willing to put in to the, the project. You know, if I went to Microsoft and said, hi, I'd love to, to, you know, I don't want to come work for you, but I'd love to sit there and help write a bunch of code for you to use in Windows. They're not going to go for that, even if I would do it for free. But, you know, if I come to a Debian developer and say, Hi, I'd like to help you out, you know, making your package better and adding new features to it and work with you to get these into your upstream, um, they're not guaranteed to say yes, but they generally do because we, wanna, we are a community. And that's the value of Debian, is it basically allows you to take a good idea like this and to have a chance to put it together as a real part of a production operating system so that it's actually in the hands of end users all over the world. 
and it's, in the, it's a tool that's available for anyone building off of Debian. And um, to, to be able to be part of the community and to do that focused on your idea rather than on what business relationships you can sign. And I don't think anyone else can do that. It's an amazing power that we as a project have. Okay, roll or? Okay, so here, so let's, let's get down to some details. What are we actually talking about in terms of um, the kind of work that needs to be done within Debian? Um, this is, one of the things about this project is it's, it's a very, um, it's, it is a very large, um, well, it's both a vertical and a horizontal project, but basically there's a lot of, a lot of small changes needed, needed everywhere, which is something that many project managers I talk to, you know, blanch in, in, in horror at. But frankly, Debian's really good at that. I mean, I can go open, you know, 50 bugs, all with small patches, and if they're on different packages, there's a pretty good chance that, you know, I mean, I'm gonna have to go triage them and see which ones get taken and which ones don't. But we actually know how to apply manpower to that kind of patch review um, across a bunch of different packages very well. So what do we need to do? We need to, you know, I mentioned that the applications were good at Kerberos and GSS, but not really so good at some other things in GSS. We need to fix that. That's gonna be small three or four line patches to a bunch of packages. In a few cases, a little bit more. Um, another thing we need to do is we need to actually package the GSS API mechanism we're using. Well, I mean, that's a new package. It happens I'm maintaining one of the GSS glue libraries. I think I can probably manage that. Um, you know, if not, I'm sure I can get some help and, and that won't be too hard. Uh, we need to package some extensions to free radius. Um, that we're working on getting them incorporated upstream. Um, we'll see how well that goes. I need to work with uh, Fedon to get, um, he maintains the radius client uh, we want to use and it's going to turn into a library and, uh, you know, we're going to work with him to package that. Then there's the second part of the project having to do with SAML integration. This is actually a little bit scary to those who, who understand what's involved, at least the bottom, two bullet, or the, the bottom bullet here. Um, but basically what we need to do is, is get some extensions um, into some of the SAML infrastructure in Debian, um, and also get some extensions to um, an Iceweasel extension and some extensions to um, Apache. Um, all of these are things that really ought to be fairly easy to deal with. Um, but that's the sort of thing that it takes to actually you know, put this together as a real tool in an operating system. Uh, what's this? So how are we gonna do that? Well, that's pretty obvious. I mean, basically we're gonna go put together a bunch of diffs um, and work with upstreams and work with packagers to integrate the diffs. Um, and offer to help out. I mean, basically, one of the things we'll do is, you know, where we can split the technology we need off into its own package, we'll do that, and we'll, you know, and I'll maintain it, or one of the other people involved in the project will maintain it. Okay, what do we have here? Right, so um, there are a lot of ways that you can get involved in this work. Um, first of all, we'd be very interested, you know, in people who want to help code, want to help add support to their favorite application, um, want to, um, you know, join our discussions. Um, one thing I'll, you know, um, want to join our design discussions, want to write code, want to test, want to help us package. Um, one thing I'm going to discuss in a little bit of detail here, because um, I think people may assume it's hard and it isn't, is participate in the IETF. Um, I actually should have said, and, well, and Oasis there. Um, a lot of the standardization effort we're going to be doing is in the Internet Engineering Task Force, the same people who bring you um, things like SMTP. Um, IETF meetings are kind of expensive. That's okay. You don't need to go to IETF meetings to participate. To participate in the IETF, you need to join a mailing list. Um, and you need to write, um, sometimes you need to write documents in XML and turn them into text files. Um, that's really it. Um, Basically, it's a consensus-based organization in many ways similar to, to Debian, except um, it, does, it tends to actually broad, build consensus in a, a bit broader of a community. There's not the concept that if you own the package that you, know, you own the changes to the package. Um, you know, within the Debian community, there have been some concerns about patents in the IETF. Um, they have a more open to patents policy than we do. Well, we're, okay, they are, 
that is at least a perception. Um, there is, however, um, there are, if any of the authors of Moonshot or of, of this technology had patents relevant to parts of the technology um, that were, um, that have already been discussed, they would have already needed to declare that and no one has made such a declaration. So you can draw your own conclusion about whether patents are a real issue in this space um, from, from that, basically. They would have had to already say that there were patents and no one has made such a statement. Um, so there's our website at the bottom. Um, you know, if you're blogging about this sort of stuff, let us know. We can add you to your add, add you to our RSS feed. Um, if you want to get involved, we have some mailing lists, two of them now. Um, and you know, there's a lot of implementation work. We'd really like to work on this. Um, at this point, I'd like to open it up to questions. Uh, you know, anything about you know the broader or questions and discussion. Anything about the broader issue of, of you know Debian and as a as a tool for this sort of change and and, and evolution of the enterprise. Um, as well as the specific technology, you know, whatever you want, ask, discuss, let's have fun. So for those three-part diagrams, what keeps the thing in the middle from replaying uh, my credential? Uh, where are we? Keep, your roll of Debian, keep going. Yeah, that, no, that's fine. So uh, client ser this is the client server, EAP server Right, okay. Diagram. So. Um, it's a um, it's a multi round trip exchange. There's a nonce. So, uh, uh, so math. Gotcha. Yes, math. <laughs> I'm not sure if I understand correctly in this uh, diagram. Does it mean that all my client um, applications will have to be linked against a just API, which is already the case, but also against a radius client? Um, no, so your application wouldn't have to. The GSS, so your, your application is probably already linked against the GSS. Yeah. Um, the GSS is going to dynamically load a GSS, the, the Moonshot GSS mechanism, which one of its shared library dependencies will be um, libratsec proxy, which doesn't exist yet, but, but will sometime this fall. So yes, but, the, but, you're, but you don't need to make any change, you don't inherently need to make any changes to your application. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but uh, this seems to me a somewhat complex architecture. Uh, this, in this way, for example, uh, a bug in, in the Radius AV, uh, library makes all your uh, applications vulnerable and so on. And also I see that on your uh, website uh, you talk also about NFS. How do, would that work for NFS? So, um, lib uh, rpc.jssd and rpc. Um, uh, there okay the gssvcd are the two um, things that would link against um, uh, the two things that would link against um, okay so it's still all, all done in user space oh yeah it's all in user space we're going to export the same context that kerberos already exports um, as far as the vulnerability um, actually, one of the nice things about this um, architecture is that it limits the, the, the number of parties you're willing to exchange things with. Um, basically, yes, your, you, your application will have a radius client. However, um, it, will only, you know, it will only open outbound connections to radius, um, only to a particular radius server that, that you have chosen. Um, and you can do arbitrary filtering in that radius server for radius protocol stuff. So basically, you know, you have a proxy point. Effectively, you have a firewall point built into the architecture where you can do as much security firewalling as you want. But I mean, yeah, you know, ultimately, I showed you the slide with the parties involved in the federation. Ultimately, you have that many parties involved. And so ultimately, each of those parties can be an attack surface. Thanks. Uh, Jeff Crook. Jeff Crompton from Trinity College. Um, I was just wondering if IETF still require a working implementation for a standard to be ratified. Um, IETF is, okay, so there are, well, well first of all, we hope to have one, so that shouldn't be a problem. Um, second of all, there are three levels on the internet standards track. The bottom level, proposed standard, which frankly is what a lot of things, for example, XMPP, SSH are at, um, does not require multiple imp implementations. Um, the upper two levels do. Um, there's a sort of feeling in the IETF community that our standards process is a little too baroque. The fact that things like 
SSH, you know, which I think people realize SSH is a reasonably mature technology, haven't bothered to advance along that track, suggests that perhaps advancing along that track is too hard. Um, at the plenary and in last week's IETF meeting, uh, we basically discussed some simplifications. We're still going to set it up so that um, there's still belief that there's value in documenting when you do have a real implementation of something. Um, and so there is going to be a level that, that, that reflects that. Um, but I believe that one, Moonshot would be valuable even if it didn't reach that level, and two, it should be able to reach that level. Hi, uh, I have a, I guess it's more of a... Uh, name, please. Oh, I'm Greg. Uh, I'm a local okay. technologist. Uh, I am a, a participant in a team that is working on roughly the same project, so this is more of a, a, a plug and a request that you, you come, to, come to our talk if you can make it. We're doing the same sort of thing, but instead of using uh, like Radius and GSS uh, API, we're kind of leveraging the same sort of ideas, but using OpenPGP to build a web of trust, and we right. have things for you know uh, like a SSH using it, using them as SSH keys and you know right. plugging them into the broken X509 uh, area and authenticating websites and trusting websites uh, based on that versus uh, these other technologies. And this is a, a this is a very interesting thing, and yep. it's outside of our yep. kind of expertise. The radius idea is not one that I had ever right. I had ever considered just through my own lack of ex experience. So well, it's a different. <laughs> So the, the difference, you have chosen um, a path or an optimization, which is great if you can make it. Basically, you have the same credential, namely a PGP key, throughout the system. Um, and in an environment where you can make that optimization, there are some security advantages, um, and there are some, um, um, there are some um, other s complexity advantages. For example, the US government has chosen to do that. The credential of choice they've chosen rather than PGP is X509 certificates. Um, P I understand why you would want to do PGP instead for your model. I would actually le recommend that you take a look at um, doing a GSS mech um, because it may make application integration easier for some applications that you care about. Um, but um, but it, it's a very interesting, you know, yours is a very different, interesting idea. It doesn't meet some of the enterprise constraints, um, but what I'm doing doesn't meet some of your constraints. So it's, it's you know, great to have um, multiple different approaches on different yeah, places on the spectrum. I mean, our approach was certainly one from a from a different from a oh, different yeah. perspective, and it's and it's very interesting to see to see it from another side. Oh, absolutely. So I really, I'm really. But but I mean, believe, but, he, but I think you know the GSS angle may actually help you guys out. Yeah. Even in what you're that doing. That is that is a very big concern. Is right. is how do we get clients to start? Right. And I, and I I and basically that's an area where we could collaborate because um, basically the work to get one a client working with multiple GSS mechanisms is basically the same regardless. And um, it's a work where, especially in Debian, we can really collaborate because um, we can do the work of making sure that all a user has to do is install either the Moonshot GSS mechanism or your GSS mechanism, and the rest of the work is common between our projects in a way we yeah. can collaborate. Yeah, and absolutely. So I'd be delighted to work on that. Yeah, yeah, we would be very happy to okay. work on that. I'm not a GSS guy, but we have sure. some folks. We can help you, I mean, with, with that. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, hi, my name is Burju Maya Dengti from uh, Stevenson Institute of Technology. I'm a researcher. Um, first, I'd like to add a note, if I may, and I will ask you a question. Um, well, I think there is a clear difference between authentication and certification. To coming back to your point, I think it's necessary to um, draw a line in between, and the need for federated login systems uh, rose from the fact that a lot of users actually um, use different services from different websites, and most users actually uh, seem to use the same username over the internet, and uh, users may also use weak passwords as well. Right. So the federated login system is actually, um, <clears throat> excuse me, providing a way to um, kind of <clears throat> facilitate, facilitate a process for the user so that they don't have to enter the uh, same credentials over and over again. And um, you know, open ID is again another layer of playing that role in between. And um, the um, concern that I wanted to point out is the privacy issue. 
and uh, I don't think I uh, heard you talk about that. Uh, yes. And um, yeah, because federated login systems, as um, you know, as useful as they are, um, you know, just bring this uh, problem with them is. Uh, the problem is that the user may uh, authenticate um, himself or herself to the server, the uh, IDP, and then IDP connects to the server, and um, the IDP keeps the login information for the user with their full name and their email address, and sends that information to the server, and the server keeps record of their um, online activity, online behavior, and their email address or their username or whatever. Mm. And this information can be tra traced back to the user, so it creates some uh, privacy concerns and privacy issues. And um, there has been a recent uh, development in this area. There's a new concept offered, and it's called uh, pseudo ID and uh, it was offered by um, Stephen Weiss from MIT. This is a very recent uh, project that's still work in progress. I, as the last time I checked it hasn't been published. But the idea is using Chalm's um, eCache model to uh, play a role in between this whole thing. And what it does or what it offers is that um, there's actually too much information running between the user and the server and the identity provider. In order to authenticate a user, you don't need to provide that much information. Mm -hmm. And what happens is the identity provider, instead of keeping all the full name record and email address and everything, the identity provider sends the user a token, and the user uses that token to, to authenticate themselves to the service pro provider. It's a little bit... Uh, awkward and not really straightforward right. to get, but uh, I believe um, a, a, a project like you know your project uh, being still underdeveloped and on, on Debian can greatly benefit from that kind of privacy, um, you know, precaution or sure. just yeah the extended like um, I, you know ad additional level of privacy. Thank you. Uh, yeah. So we actually okay. I, uh, there are a finite number of things, and I really probably should have for this audience included the privacy spiel in here. Um, that's not the solution we've adopted, but I believe that the solution we have has um, practically similar security properties. Um, so basically, um, how much information is released by the IDP to the service provider is a matter of um, negotiation between the user, the IDP, and the service provider. Um, this is absolutely critical. Remember, this is a European-funded product, and we have to deal with the European uh, uh, Data Privacy Directive. Um, and so, basically, we, we absolutely have to do this. Um, you can release as, middle, as little information as, you know, here's a random identifier that is unique to this single authentication. And that's all I'm, I'm going to tell you. They're from my organization. I'm going to tell you this random identifier. Um, or you can release claims about the user. You know, they're over 18. They're one of my students. They're one of my employees. Um, they have classification TS-Q, um, or you can go all the way to, um, here's their full name, I've sent you a copy of their, uh, of a sequenced copy of their genome, um, <laughs> you know, their, um, uh, you know, here's, here's the hypnotic suggestion that, that will allow you to take over their brain, um, you know, all the way up to that, depending on what level of privacy is appropriate between the service and, and um, and that um, the current version basically makes that a model of policy, um, but it's something where there we sort of understand that we can move it to a consent framework in the future and actually get the user more involved in that discussion with no change to the architecture. If I can add a little bit to that, uh, I mean, I think that the privacy issue is actually one of the really major places where OpenID is not an adequate technology, and the SAML uh, technology stack is much better because the SAML folks have actually thought a lot about uh, information control. So in a SAML universe, your identity provider knows, usually knows a, a fair bit about you because that's where you're authenticating to, but at that, the, your, your information can stop there. And um, because your identity provider has complete control over how much information that they release, and there's also a strong uh, tendency inside the SAML community, uh, which is already being used to authenticate people to things like Google and to things like um, Salesforce.com and some of the other cloud applications, there's already a strong sense in the SAML community that you, you by default, release nothing. 
and you add specific attributes requested by a particular service provider only when that service provider absolutely needs it, and that's all you ever release. Uh, and that's, that's already working with the web federations. And so extending that model right. forward to other kind of uh, other sorts of applications, it makes a lot of sense. And it means that you're dealing with that privacy uh, stuff up front. And people who are SAML consumers are generally used to getting things like uh, unique identifier keys that where every single different application you authenticate to uh, gets a completely different identity for you. Uh, but each time you go to that same application, they may get a consistent identity for that application if that's what that application requires. Right. I will admit I'm not the privacy person involved in this project, but that's, I, I, you know, um, that's okay because there are, I can name two or three people who are. Other questions? We have another 15 minutes uh, on the schedule. Well, we can get dinner early. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all. Now I have to recover my chair. Yes.